again. How's everybody doing this morning? Amen. Well, for those expecting Pastor Joe, I'm not Pastor Joe. I'll let that sink in for a minute. I'm going to get a drink of water here. Today we're going to talk, uh, we're going to talk out of the book of Esther. And uh, just to start, let me give you some background on, on the book of Esther. And this is uh, not the NSAD, NIV, NIV. This is more of the, the Pastor Gary version. And so what's going on? Let me give you the background a little bit again. So Esther is a Jewish woman, uh, and she, her uncle is Mordecai. And at this time, the king has decided to take on a new queen. And so through a series of, of things that have occurred, uh, Esther has been chosen to be queen. And Haman has become essentially the second command uh, of the empire. Now, Haman is somebody that opposed the Jewish people. And, and as you read in Esther, the reason why he opposed the Jewish people is because every day Mordecai would go to the gates and check on his, on his niece, right? Well, everybody bowed, at Haman, bowed before Haman as he entered to the gates, except Mordecai. Well, he got offended. And so he plotted to kill all, all the Jewish people. So he went to the king and, and he said, you know, these people have their own beliefs. These people have, have their own ideologies that go against the kingdom. So I think it would be in your best interest to go ahead, let's kill every Jew, that Jewish person that's in the empire. The king said, okay, let's go ahead and do that. Well, you know, that, that's where we are. So Haman hates the Jewish people for no other reason that he was offended. So Mordecai sends word to Esther saying there's going to be a plot against the Jewish people and they're look, you know, Haman's looking to kill all the Jewish people. And Esther, and as we get into it, Esther is stalling at that request to save the Jewish people. And that's kind of where we are. But Haman is more than just a person, right? Haman is the world because the world hates Christians. Right? Haman's are all over. It's the world. It's Satan. It, it's pornography. It's any sin that you can think about that goes against God and the Christian faith. So how many in here, and don't raise your hand, but how many in here are facing Haman's today? Right? Because they just don't like what we stand for. And it's better just to get rid of us because we offend because of our faith and our belief. So oh, we'll continue. So the first thing is, if you can go ahead and turn that slide for me. The first thing is there's a time for desperation. So in Esther 4.13, then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, do not imagine that you in the king's palace can escape any more than all the Jews. Mordecai is telling Esther, don't think because you're in the, in the kingdom, in the palace, that you're going to avoid this, this plot to kill the Jewish people. You're not safe there just because you're the queen. So Haman is threatening, and no more time than no no other time in history than right now is Satan moving on, on on the Christian faith, and it's because of what we stand for. So what are we going to do? Are we going to stall? This is the desperation that, that Esther is feeling. What do I do? While we stall, countless of of, of babies are being killed through abortion. There, I, I was reading an article, or I saw something on TV that there was a political figure and, and she said, I know what abortion is, it, you're killing babies. But I'm okay with that because it's, it's women's rights. Nobody should think about the baby's rights. We will, we will risk our lives and limbs for a whale or a snail, but what about the babies? What about the unborn? Where is our moral compass as a society when we're more concerned about making sure that the habitat of a horned frog is secure 
than a baby coming into the world. That's, that's what Haman's, Haman's doing. He's more worried about society and, you know, they don't stand up, they don't march up to our beliefs, uh, and so let's just get rid of everybody because they offend. Assisted suicides, you know, that's just another thing. There, there's no sanctity of life. I was, it's this, and also this new age movement, right? So it's not just, it's, it, it's not just abortion. It's not just, it's anything that goes against what we're doing. The world is, we're, we're, people are just trying to grab onto anything to make their reality better. It's the new age movement. It's, there's a channel for Scientologists. Right? Have y'all seen that on direct TV or something? They're coming up with a channel for Scientology. That's just, basically, it's just another reality TV show. Because it, it's, it, it's all fake. But it makes somebody feel better about themselves. The youth are under attack. I mean, just coming out of education, our kids are, are under so much attack every day. Uh, there's a, a, a report out and it's 30 to 40% of junior high students are uh, involved in immoral acts that could be having premarital sex, drugs, you know, anything and everything that goes against what God is teaching. 50 to 60% of our high school students are seeing this every day. You see it in the news that our students at, at school, at now, I'm 43, and I can remember my high school. I don't remember the thing, nothing that a student is going through today that I go through as a high school student. But that's where the world is. 20 years ago, there were TV shows that wouldn't have been, been allowed on TV, let alone on prime time, 7, 8 o'clock. But that's what's going on. Because we, as Christians, are stalling. We are not taking the stand. We have a mighty voice, but we're stalling. So when, when do we reach to that time of our desperation? Are we just going to be okay? Our students are finding, you know, kids are finding anything and everything to feel accepted. Gangs, again, homosexuality is so just welcome and it's so pre prevalent in, in society today. Where again, when I was in high school, we didn't see those things. I was a middle school principal. We, I had 6th, 7th, and 8th grade girls and boys dressing dress the opposite sex. Talking about having girlfriends and boyfriends. Really? 11, 12, and 13 year olds. But as parents, as adults, as Christians, well, I don't want to offend. I want them to be able to find their way. That's what it's... I'm a, I'm a parent. Until you pay your bills, I'm finding your way. And as Haman is secretly plotting against the Jews, if you think about it, he's plotting against the church, right? Because he's looking to just wipe out the Jewish population within the, his empire, which is 127 provinces, anywhere from India to Ethiopia. He's looking to wipe, these, wipe this, this civilization out. What we got to be careful, though, is, you know, Jesus talked about it a little bit. We have to be careful with our church and who leads our church. And we have to protect those people that lead our church. Ministers are under attack. Pastors are under attack. Three or four years ago, the city of Houston was asking for, for, for uh, sermon notes. The, the government is looking to take our, our tax exemption away. But it's not only the church, it's the body as well. In Oregon, we got the, the florist and the, baker, the bakeries that are being shut down because they won't sell the same-sex marriage couple, or same-sex couples because of their religious beliefs. We got stores being closed down because they won't provide uh, you know, insurance for same-sex marriages. All of that is a plot against the church. But again, what are we going to do? Have we reached to that point of desperation? Or are we just okay? And that's not even talking about the personal Hamans that we experience in our lives daily. But we just let it go. We just let it be. We compartmentalize. 
We just allow it to happen because, you know, it, it's really okay right here. I'm going to stand here. Maybe every once in a while I'm going to lean over here a little bit. But as we continue to lean, we, we, we just allow just allow that evil just to continue to come into our lives and come into our lives and come into our lives. But ultimately, there's the desperation of hell. Hell's a real, pl a real place. And your loved ones, your neighbors, your friends, your family, good doesn't get you into heaven. And waiting till tomorrow doesn't get you into heaven. You have to come to that place of brokenness. You get, come to that place of brokenness and you get there when you're desperate. Have you ever been in that place where you're desperate and you say, God, I can't do it. I can't. Where are you at? Second thing is time of destiny. In Esther 4.14, and who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Right? That's what Mordecai's telling Esther is, are you sure God didn't put you here for just for such a time as this? God has a plan for your life. Do you know that? Because if you don't, I'm here to tell you, it says it right here in Isaiah 6, 8. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, here I am, send me. For those of that know it, you have to be sold out. You got to be sold out for Jesus. Because if you're not, you're not doing God's work. God is looking for people to realize what their, what their plan is and to accomplish that plan. Not to talk about it. We have a saying in my house, and I tell my boys this all the time when they're thinking about something, right? That, that's, the, that's, that's famous last words, right? Especially for men. Well, I'll think about it. You either make moves or you make excuses. That's all you can do. Those are the only two choices when it comes down to it. So what's your plan for, what is God's plan for you? God still uses people in extraordinary ways. Those, those miracles that you read about and how God used average people in the Bible still happen today. And they happen because people open themselves to what God's will is in for their, God's will is for their life. Amen. I'm sure many can share this story. I was broken, you know. Former drink, I drank, you know. Uh, my marriage was in shambles, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But God used me when I said, God, I can't do it anymore. Your will for my life. You have a, a, a ministry, and your ministry is not Sunday between 1045 and 12, keeping a chair warm. Your ministry is out there. The ministry field is not Belize. It's your zip code. It's your neighborhood. It's your house. And so... What are you doing to further the kingdom using your, using, using your ministry and the gifts God has given you? You have been equipped and prepared with a gift. God has given each one of us gifts. And like I've said, said for, since the day I got here, if God hasn't revealed that to you, just let me know and I'll find a place for you. Because our church needs people. Because it's the body that continues to, to further the kingdom. You can come in and you can fold brochures and bulletins. You, you can come in and clean the church. You can come in and, and call first-time visitors. You can come in and, and, and do whatever you want within reason for the kingdom of God. Don't forget, and I'll never forget this, you know, 
you're an ambassador for Christ. You are part of the holy family. And so don't be ashamed of that. Right? You should be, every day we're the salt and the light. And we're ambassadors and, and we should go out and, and share the word. And so what is your destiny? What has God given, put on your heart to further the kingdom? Because I'm sure it's not, you know, we, we had a, a, a phrase and I'm sure everybody has this phrase, you know, live like the devil Monday to Saturday and ask for forgiveness on Sunday. That's not your destiny. Your destiny is waking up every day, thank God for the breath in your, in your lungs and seeing what you can do about sharing the word and winning souls. That, that, that's your destiny. God has a plan for the church. And it's to win souls. But there are some preachers and some pastors and, and, and some, some, some guests or some, some members. And I'm not speaking here. I'm just speaking, you know. Uh, in general, there are pastors that are more concerned about nickels and noses, meaning the people in the seats and the money in the tide box. And let me not offend because then guess what's going to happen? My nickels are going to go down and my noses are going to go down. So let me just, I'm okay, you're okay, we're okay. And that's not the plan for the church. The plan for the church is to build a body of believers, to equip them. Yes, the tape is tripping me, but, but this, is, this is my line right here. So I told you I walk. So, um, and, and, so people are more, and, and there are people that are members and, and people that are, you know, that are Christians and, and God-loving Christians, but sometimes their ministry becomes more important than the word and the body and what they're doing. Always remember, it comes back to this. It comes back to worship. And worship is, you know, praise and worship. It's hearing the word. It's being with the, the whole group here. It's loving on each other. Because nobody's the lone ranger. You can't do anything on your own. Because guess what? I don't, uh, for those of you who've never seen the Lone Ranger, even the Lone Ranger had Tonto. So let somebody be a blessing. And I know for me, sometimes my ego can get in the way and my pride. And somebody asks, how can I help you? Oh, I'm fine, brother. What, you know what I'm doing? I'm robbing that brother from a blessing that God has put on his, or her, his heart to help me. So I can tell you what, in the two months that I've been here, pray for me. Because you need the practice and I need the prayer. <laughs> so think, just don't make the quick answer of, I'm okay. Because brother and sisters, God put that on their heart to, to tell, not to ask you, but to tell you, how can I help you? So I guess a better would be, I'm going to help me help you. You either tell me what you need or I'm just going to do it, right? We should all be available and open to hear what the Spirit has for us. And again, who am I to rob a blessing from one of y'all? When we talk about how God has a plan for our church, it's important that we all stay consistent and we all defend and protect the pastors and the body of believers that are here. And that's one of our non-negotiables. If, you, if you've gone through one-on-one, -on -one, it talks about that, defending our pastors, def going to your brother with loving kindness. It's, it's not to create disunity, it's to create unity. We have to, you know, during this time when, when Esther is, is in the castle and she hears this, it's for such a time as this, it, it makes her pause. And she says, you know, what am I going to do? She's thinking, what am I going to do? You know, and 
when it comes to your destiny, you know, we, we have to go out and, and, and disciple and reach people. And we're not going to reach people with cookies and, and, and punch, punch and milk and cookies. We have to get out there. Now, it's great to have events to bring them here, but what are we doing to create events to get to them? Uh, I'll share an example. So last Sunday at Lyft, right, uh, we were sitting there. I think there was four or five of us. And this guy walks in. His, his name is Diego Ferguson. And he walks in and he, he says, hi, you know, I'm here to, to come to Lyft. I'm like, oh, great. How'd you hear about our church? Oh, well, a couple months ago, there were some kids at Walmart passing out brochures and flyers. So finally had time. So I decided, let me come. That's what it's about, right? It's, it's about going out and reaching them. The, the pretty sign is great. The signage is great. But if that's all it is, how many, how many people have ever gone to something because of a sign? Or how many people have gone to something because somebody invited them to church? Somebody that you know said, you know what? You need to come to church with me. That's what it's about. And as a ministry, we need to fall in love with, as ministers of our ministry, we need to fall in love with Jesus. And we need to be equipped with Jesus. And, and if we get told no, it's okay. Because there's always the next person. We might just be planting the seed for the next person to work on it. So don't, oh, that's one of the things on, you know, when we go to Belize, we talk about that. You know, don't be discouraged if you don't, if, if you don't have the privilege of Winning somebody to Christ. Because you might just be planting the seed. That's all you might be doing. But it's better than not planting a seed at all. Right? And maybe that's, what the, that, that's where you are. That's all you need to do is just plant that seed. Talk to that person. Encourage that person. Tell them you need, you know, come to church. Talk to them about Jesus. You know, we've all heard the story. You know, Chuck was, had, uh, well, for those of you who don't have, know, you know, Chuck was playing tennis that day, right? And he was playing with a, a couple of guys. And, and one of the guys that he was playing with was a non-believer. And can you believe that Chuck's been working on his heart all these years? Just to win him to Christ. He might not want him to Christ, but I tell you what, he planted that seed. And the outpouring of love that was shown in the past week, I'm sure that gentleman is now thinking, wow, this is what it's all about. Yes. This is what it's all about, to hug when we're hurt, to smile when we're happy, and to encourage the body to, to just press on. During this time when, when she was stalling, you know, she, she asked that Mordecai and, and that group fast and pray, as she said she would do th uh, as well. And um, in Esther 4.15, then Esther bade them return to Mordecai this answer, go, gather together all the Jews that are present in Shashan and fast ye for me and neither eat nor drink three days, nights or day. I also and my maidens will fast likewise and so will I go into the king, which is not according to the law. And if I perish, I perish. Now you got to understand, you know, you think today, uh, husband and wife, if a, a wife has a question, what is she going to do? She's going to go ask her husband. But there was a law during this time that y you didn't go into the, king, the king's area unless you were called upon. And if you went into the, 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 the palace or where the king was, and he didn't accept you, you could be put to death. It wasn't unless he reached out his scepter and received you that you knew that, whew, I'm okay. So that was a big risk. She, you know, do I not do anything? Do I go in and risk being put to death? And so that's why she asked for them to fast. Now, why do we fast and pray? Well, to see God's face. To see what God wants for, our, for, for us. You know, uh, we, we're talking on Wednesday, and, and, and the thing is, 
and I can't recall what verse it was, but it talks about, you know, you ask not, you have not because you ask not, but the next verse next to it, I think it's 4.2, and then 4.3 talks about, but you, what you're asking is not according to our, my will for you. And so that's why we pray. We pray to seek God's face. This is a time that our church is hurting right now and, and we all need prayer. And, and it's not just because one of our brothers is in heaven. I mean, praise God. But it's for those that are still here. We need prayer. We have marriages. We have, we have people uh, with illnesses. We have everyday life going on. Why would you want to go it alone? It's through prayer. It's the honor and privilege of going to your father and asking for help and seeking his face and not moving or not taking it back. How many of you have prayed for something and then when it didn't happen, you took it back, right? And he said, I, I trust you, I trust you, I trust you. It's not moving fast enough. I'm going to take it back. Well, maybe you're not getting it because that's not what God wants for you. Maybe that's not the prayer you need to be asking or praying. It's God, your will be done. Not my will and just make it happen. Prayer and fasting disciplines our spirit. It brings our relationship closer to God because it allows us to fully rely on him. Fasting is a very sacred thing. And when we do it, we do it ju just not to say we're fasting, but it's, it's a commitment that we have that, God, I truly want to seek your face. God, I truly want to hear your voice, what you want from my life in this decision, whether it's to move a new job uh, to, you know, to whatever it is, to buy a house, to buy a car, to have a child, to whatever decision it is, it should always be, you should always seek God's face first. Because how many times have you made a decision, maybe not look, seeking God, and then the next day you're like, wow, I really shouldn't have made that decision. Or wow, I really made that decision and it's not what I thought it was, right? I've done that. And you're, you're there kicking yourself because you're like, man, I should have just waited. I should have just waited. It aids in, it allows, through prayer and fasting, it allows you to repent for the things that you, and, and the sins that you've committed. And, and it allows you, it allows God to come in and, and, and see where your sin is and, and give you an idea of where your sin is and, and, and you can ask for forgiveness for those things. Um, one of the practices that, that I do is I write, you know, all the things that I, you know, God show me where, where my, you know, what I've failed you in and I write it down, right? And then uh, I leave, I, I walk away from it. And then I go back, I said, God, you know, I, pr I pray over each one of those things and I say, God, you know, if there's anything else, just give it to me so I can put it on paper, put it on paper put it on paper. Then I pray over each one of those things again, and then I ask forgiveness for each one of those things, and then I burn it. Because you know what? When God forgives you of your sin, it is as far as the east is to the west. It is forgiven. But if you don't know what your sin is, then you don't know what to ask for. It's also an opportunity to turn from ourselves. Because we are very self-centered individuals, and, and I'm not, I am too. I mean, we're all self-centered because we live, we're in the flesh. We're sin nature. It's our sin nature to be selfish. But when we pray and fast, we are turning to our, turning from ourselves and seeking God to come into our lives and say, God, you use me. God, move me in the area you want to move me. That's what praying and fasting allows, uh, allow, what allows to happen. Uh, 
finally, it, uh, it allows God to accomplish his work. If you don't know what God's will is for you, how can he accomplish any work in you? If you keep turning from God, how can God do anything? You have to, you know, you have to stop running from God and run to God and say, God, use me, and God, forgive me, and God, I just want to be here with you in the moment. And you have to, it, it, it has to be from you. It has to be a real interaction with God. And it comes when you have brokenness in your heart and you want to die and you, and you want your, to die to yourself and, and accept the Holy Spirit and help, accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You know, even throughout the Bible, we talk about, it talks about how people went to pray and people went to pray. You know, Jonah... Uh, in Jonah 3, 5, he prayed for the Ninevites. You know, Judah prayed for, you know, they prayed in 2 Chronicles for Judah and, and, and for the country. And we still need to pray for our country. We need to pray for our leaders. Even if you didn't vote for him, you still got to pray for him because he's still your leader. Because he's making decisions that impact you. You might not think that it impacts you in Spring, Texas, but it impacts you. Through your wallet, through your loved ones, through what, you know, every day. One of us, some of, some, of, some of us in here have loved ones that are in the military. The decision our president and our government officials are making impact us. So why would we not want, not want to lift them up? We have people that are, that are working and, and they, they might be, their jobs might be in jeopardy because of the government making a decision. So yes, absolutely. Your life is impacted by the decision that the, the president and the government makes. So pray for them. And vote. Fourth thing, it's a time of dispensation. You know, this is when it comes to the church age. All, all the prophecies that the Bible talks about are done, right? We are living in the end time. Every day we get closer and closer and closer to that union of, the, of Jesus and the bridegroom. Every day. And Joe's, Pastor Joe's been talking about it. How long are you going to let those frogs linger? Tomorrow? Well, as we know, you might not get tomorrow. And so at what point do you need to make the decision that it's time to come home and, and ask for forgiveness. You know, Romans talks about, Romans 13, 11 through 14, and do this knowing the time that it is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep. For now, salvation is nearer to us than we, when we believe. The night is almost gone and the day is at hand. Let us therefore lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscu promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regards to its lusts. All the signs are there. Israel is a nation in, in the Middle East. You know, Russia, Syria, North Korea, the, these are all things that are coming and, and, and were said to come true. What we have now is an urgent call of the saints to move. We have to push away from the table and our comfort zone. And go out there and be warriors for Christ. And stand up. Put on the full armor of God every day. And win souls for Christ. Because that's what it's about. We have to take the challenge. We have to do it now. Because we're not promised tomorrow. 
How many here you could probably think right now about that one person in your life, be it a coworker, a family, a friend, a neighbor that is not in church or is unchurched or is not a believer? You could, everybody in this room can think of one person right now. That person is going to hell unless they know and love and have a relationship with Jesus Christ. D.L. Moody was asked, how do you reach the masses? So one, one person said, or he said, easy. Go after them. That's how you reach the masses. Go after them. Make up your mind. Are you going to sit down when you get home from church or from work? Or are you going to go out there and talk to the neighbor that hadn't been coming to church? That you keep on thinking every Sunday when you drive past their house and you, right before you pull in, you know what, I need to talk to Joe next week about going to church. And then it's fleeting. As a reminder, when it comes to you not telling people, when you don't warn the wicked of their ways, the blood is on your hands because you've not shared the word. You've given them the opportunity to be saved and you've done nothing. It's time for a decision. And in Esther 4, 4, 16b, she says, if I perish, I perish. Well, Esther did go, right? Esther did go to the, to the king, and the king accepted her. And she told the king about the plot. And the king brought, you know, how did you hear about this? Well, Mordecai told me. So the, Mord, brought in Mordecai, Mordecai, what's going on? He said, well, Haman is plotting against, is against the Jews and trying to kill everybody. So what, ha what happened? Haman, Haman was hung by the same gallows that he had built for Mordecai. And the Jewish, the, the, civil, the Jews in the empire were saved because one person, decided to step up and say, if not me, then who? But it's for me, it's, it, I'm going to decide to do this. And if I die, I die. People are making that decision every day across the world. Christians are dying because of their faith. And here in the States, it's eh, because we're, we don't see it. We don't experience that. So it's time to make a decision. Are we going to be wrapped up into the material things like in the world? Are we going to be soul winners for Christ? What are you going to do? Are you going to be just okay? Again, I'm okay, you're okay, we're okay. I understand you're living a homosexual lifestyle. I understand you're living in sin. I understand you, you're married, but you got three, three girlfriends. But you know what? I'm okay. You're okay. We're okay. Are you going to confront that brother and sister and say, no, right is right, wrong is wrong. You're living in sin. You need to repent from what you're doing and ask God to forgive this in loving kindness. And if that doesn't work, not so loving kindness. And if that doesn't work, again, not so loving kindness. But they need to be told. Again, Ezekiel 3.18 talks about this. If we don't tell people, their blood is on our hands because we know the truth. Why am I trying to keep it a secret? 
How many of here have had people, you know, sick and you're, you're praying, God, I, if I, you know, I just don't know what, you know, I just want to, if I had something to, to give them to make them feel better. We've all had sick kids and we, we want to make sure we give them the right medicine. Well, I have the right medicine for eternal life. Why am I keeping it? Why am I just keeping it between my friends and family in here? I should be doing it out there. Sharing it with my neighbor. Sharing it with the stranger that walked by me at, at Kroger. They should see it in my life. They should see it in my walk. They should hear it in my talk. And if they're not seeing it in any of those three things, you need to find out where you're not right with God and get right so that you can share the word. There's going to come a time where we stand before the judgment seat. And are we going to be red-faced, empty-handed, and ashamed? And hear those not-so-good words, go away from me, you worker of iniquity. Go away as if I never knew you. Or... Well done, my good and faithful servant. Welcome into the arms of your master. That's real. That's in here. But what's in here? The great commission of going out and... And, 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 and spreading the word and winning souls, that hasn't changed. Now, the platform might have changed, right? Some people put things on Twitter, Facebook, Snapchat, whatever, whatever. The platform might have changed, but the message is still the same. God loves you. Die to yourself, except God as your Lord and Savior. Ask for forgiveness. And then repeat. You share another with another person. Share it with another person. That's what it's about. And then growing spiritually mature so that you can put on the full armor of God so that you can minister to people. As a reminder, you know, to whom much is given, much is required. We all have the truth here. But if I don't share it, then I'm defying God. You know, I mean, okay, this is funny and probably not, um, not the best story, but I'm going to share it anyway. Y'all are my family. So uh, I guess about 10 years ago, uh, I was outside working in the yard, right? And... Uh, some Jehovah Witnesses came by, right? Not to, to, to knock them, but they came by. And uh, she was like, hey, I want to talk to you about Jehovah Witness, whatever, whatever. I was like, okay, but I'll tell you what. You can tell me about your, your Jehovah Witness thing, but I want to tell you uh, about my, my faith and being a Christian. She was like, okay. I said, well, I go first. And she's like, okay. So, I, you know, I talked her through, went to the Roman road, talked to her about my faith. And I said, I have a question for you. She said, yeah. I said, okay, in, in your, uh, in Jehovah's Witness, isn't only like 144,000 people going to heaven? And she said, yeah, I think so. I said, so why are you telling me? Because I could be taking your place. There's no limit in heaven. But only we can make it grow. And we do that by sharing the word and living the word. We have to get on target. We have to seek and save the lost. We have to preach without compromise. And just because I'm up here doesn't mean you can't preach down there. We will call God's church to wake and move forward. Now, men, you're the spiritual leader of your house, not your wife, 
not the TV. You are the spiritual leader. When you follow your wife, you are putting her in a position that God did not intend for her to be in. You're the spiritual leader for your, for your family, your wife, your kids, anybody under your household. That is your responsibility, and you're going to be answered. You're going to have to answer for that. So don't say, well, I, I usually let my wife lead us in prayer. Why? Well, I just, you know, I want my, my I just allow my wife to, to tell what we're going to read about. Why? God didn't put that on her. God put that on you. You need to own that. And that's every day. Not just on Sundays, but every day that ends in Y, you need to be a spiritual leader in your house. So as we end, you know, we talked about time for when, when she went to when she went to the king she accepted her destiny so how many of you are willing to accept your destiny or how many are wondering what is my destiny and it's important that you know that God has placed you here for such a time as this you might not know what this is but God does so seek his face if that means coming up here to the altar, that means coming up here to the altar. If that means falling on your face daily, that means falling on your face daily. Because guess what? Your want is not his will. You might want to do something, but if that's not his will for your life, guess what? That's not your will for his, that's not his will for your life. You can still want it, and many will probably still do it, but it's in direct opposition of God. You doing it doesn't change his mind for his plan for you. So I would ask that as we close that you stand and, and, and uh, as the band comes up, uh, I ask that men come up here and, and to the front and you stand and close your eyes as we end in prayer. That if, for those of, that don't believe, and do not have a relationship with Christ. That you think about that, you pray about that, you find out why. I ask you come up here and, and pray with one of these men. For those of you who do believe, but maybe you've walked away, come back home. For those that are hurting, come to the altar. It's a warm place up here. And it's a forgiving place if you come and repent from your sin. So let's go ahead and bow our head. Father, we just thank you for this message, Father. Father, I just pray that you use these people, Father, in a mighty way, Father. Father, the further your kingdom, Father, Father, I ask that you look at each one of them and they look at themselves, Father, and they ask, Father, they ask what they could do to further the kingdom. And they pray that you use them in a mighty way, Father. Father, I ask that those that are hurting, Father, they come up, Father, and they uh, seek your face in any and all things, Father. Father, we pray for those that are sick today, Father. Father, I ask all this in your precious and holy name, Father. Come, come and, 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 and pray.